I'm going to talk to you guys about an issue that's very important to a lot of people and that a lot of people don't talk about, which is the intersection of the women's rights movement and the disability rights movement and the way that disabled people fit into the feminist message. And so before I really get started, though, I want to just give you guys a couple terms because I might use them and I want to make sure everybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, the first one is just disabled that there are various types of disability, including physical or male ability ones, but also things like psychiatric disabilities like PTSD or developmental ones like autism. And neurodivergent is something people say to refer to people with psychiatric disabilities or other cognitive disabilities that give them a cognitive and perceptual experience that's different from other people and uh, or from the societal norm. And the opposite, people call neurotypical, so you have a neurodivergent person or a neurotypical person. And then, ableism is just discrimination that favors people without disabilities. And then the last one is accessibility, which is the design of products, devices, services, or environments in a way that allows use for people with disabilities. And it can also refer to how um, open an environment is for people with disabilities. So like, I was talking with some people on our lunch break about how jobs might not like it if you bring service dogs to them and like interviews and things like that. And so that job could be considered inaccessible. And it can be things like wheelchairs, not having elevators up to your second floor presentations or whatever, or um, things like headphones being prohibited in loud environments, which is problematic for people with sensory disorders. So accessibility has a lot of different meanings and different sort of perspectives on it. But, also, I wanted to say that um, disabilities aren't all visible. In fact, a lot of them aren't. It's a really common misconception that disabled people will look like they need their assistive device and that they'll always look like that. Um, so for example, people might need a handicap placard even though they can walk part of the time if they have like chronic fatigue or pain or things like that that cause them issues. And so just because you see someone walking into a store, it doesn't mean that they don't need that handicapped parking spot. Or you might see someone who walks like you and talks like you, who needs a service dog for PTSD, autism, um, seizure disorders. Uh, my point is just that just because someone doesn't look disabled doesn't mean they aren't, and that there's no one way to look or be disabled. And so I also, um, when I was making this presentation and getting ready for it, I really wanted to ensure that I included the perspectives of the whole disabled community, particularly since I don't have mobility impairments. Um, all of my disability is other kinds of disabilities. So I did a bit of a survey and I talked to some people um, that my sister knew because she's really involved in disability advocacy and then also um, through the DRC and other uh, campus resources. And um, I did a survey with them, and I got some of their thoughts and opinions. So I just want to say thank you to all those people. I really appreciate their contributions. Um, and when I was doing this, one of the biggest sentiments I came across was just that the majority of them feel ignored more than like mistreated, and that they haven't had directly negative experiences with feminism, but they just feel like their particular perspectives and struggles as disabled women particularly are ignored or pushed to the side or just not really considered relevant or important, which they are, and they just feel um, ident uh, I sorry, invisible. Um, though interestingly, many of them still really identify strongly as feminists, as you can see, but they just um, wanted to see a lot of change in the movement, which is kind of why I wanted to address it here and bring it to you guys. So, then I was gonna say that um, it doesn't really seem very obvious at first where feminism and disability rights overlap. Like it doesn't, it's not necessarily um, easy to see, but a lot of the issues that feminists advocate for have a lot of resonance and impact in the disabled community that's not really seen or is a bit ignored. And we have this concept of what a good feminist is, like loud, outspoken, and confident, and things like that. And it's so generalized that sometimes it can isolate a little more than inspire if a woman or a person can't live up to that expectation that's put on them. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention on that is that a lot of times feminism and women's rights movements will put forth and um, advocate for this idea that women can be everything, which is great and of course what we want, but then when um, that
question is posed towards disabled women, it falls apart a little bit. So you'll hear, disabled women can't be good mothers because X, Y, Z reason, you know, they can't, because they can't walk or because they have psychiatric disabilities which limit them sometimes. And a lot of the time, those feminists who fight so strongly for women can be anything, then kind of back down and they're like, okay, well, I guess that makes sense. That's a bit of an exception. And so we really need to make sure we're fighting in those instances and standing up for uh, disabled women as much as we are abled women. Um, and more than anything else, uh, like I said, I think it's just about the invisibility of disability. Um, some disabilities are really easy to see and others aren't. And so um, I just wanna uh, encourage you to listen to everybody's thoughts and opinions and consider the experiences they could be having that you don't know about. Um, and make sure you're including uh, as many people as you can at the forefront because you don't necessarily know going in if one of the members of your feminist group or the people at your protest is disabled. So, um, a couple of ways they overlap that I wanted to highlight specifically were um, first the idea of sexual liberation and bodily autonomy. Um, part of the feminist message is this belief that, you know, uh, we should have sex positivity and, you know, no slut shaming and stuff, and of course that's uh, totally what we want. However, at this end, or to go along with that, a lot of disabled women will get really inappropriate questions, particularly the thing I'm thinking about is wheelchair users who get asked if and how they can have sex, and a lot of times um, disabled women are sort of, what's the word, um, infantilized or, you know, sort of dismissed in their sexuality, and um, they're not considered grown up enough for things like that because people associate needing assistance with uh, being, like, like I said, infantilized and things like that. So, um, sorry, I'm a little nervous. If you can't tell, I need to like relax a little. Okay, we're good. <laughs> um, so again, just sexual liberation and bodily autonomy. And then a second thing is reproductive rights. And I was a little hesitant to broach this topic because first of all, I just want to put it out there that like, I'm fully pro-choice and I'm 100% favor of a woman, you know, doing whatever she wants when she's pregnant. But if feminists are gonna be at the forefront of advocacy for pro-choice issues and talk about those things, then we also need to recognize and um, not ignore the fact that sometimes uh, Sometimes a pregnancy is terminated simply because a disability is detected early. Um, I wouldn't say it's common or the majority of abortions, I'm not claiming that, but it is a problem that we need to address, especially if we're going to be advocating for issues like pro-choice and be at the forefront of that. And like I said, I am 100% pro-choice and in favor of people doing what they want to because actually a center point of the disability rights movement is bodily autonomy and choice because a lot of disabled people, especially with those who um, may have developmental impairments or other issues that uh, give them trouble expressing themselves and doing things like that have a lot of their choice taken away from them. So I definitely am in favor of bodily autonomy and choice, but we do need to recognize that part of the problem when we're fighting for reproductive rights and ensure that some of the ableism present in our society and sort of um, salient in our society isn't affecting that while we're doing so. There are a lot, some ethical issues to consider there as well. And it's easy to understand sort of the fear and um, uh, frustration when disabled people hear that. And um, we need to combat this perception that disability is unlivable or disability is not worth life. So the other thing I wanted to address is sexual assault and violence prevention. So with the rise of Me Too and all of those kinds of movements, it's definitely become a banner of the feminist movement to uh, stop sexual assault and then things like that. Um, but, so we all kind of know the one in three statistic, one in five statistic, but does anybody know what percentage of disabled women specifically are sexually assaulted in their lifetime? I'm gonna guess it's no nope. answer. 83%. So that is four out of five people, a little over so, which if there's like 20 people in this room, that's 16 of us. And it's sort of a hidden epidemic, particularly because um, disabled women may have less access to resources.
resources or may not be able to, like I said before, speak up about their experiences. Um, and so the, my point of this being just that um, disabled women are one of the utmost demographics in the world, which is only made worse if you're also a person of color or LGBT or have other um, minority experiences. And to go along with that statistic is that disabled women are also 40% more likely to experience violence from a family member or part partner. And um, when you see these kind of statistics and stuff that go along with some of the statistics with that feminism talks about, there's no doubt that there is some intersection between disability rights and women's rights and um, that we need to do better. So, now that we've discussed the overlap, I wanted to just ask, is feminism accessible? And from the results of my survey and kind of my own experiences as well, I found that largely it's not. Like I said, it doesn't tend to be inherently like aggressive or whatever, you know? Feminists aren't like kicking disabled people out or things like that, but it's just not conscious of it. And so it's not easy for disabled people to access or it might not be possible. Um, one of the primary things with that is inaccessible meetups. If you do like a Google search of what are the, you know, feminist meetups or how can I get involved in women's rights in Norman or wherever you're living, um, the first thing you see is like protests and marches and things like that, all of which are um, uh, have some issues. Firstly, with the marches and protests, there might be mobility issues if you're expected to march literally all the way down a street or something. Somebody might not be able to do that. And the other thing is a lot of people with um, things like psychiatric disorders or autism or other things like that have something called sensory processing disorder, which means that um, when they take in something sensory, like a sound, for example, is the easiest one to do, it's amplified or overdone. So something that sounds like a normal volume to you might be overblown and really loud to them. So they might need to wear like ear protectors. You see that sometimes. Um, but my point being that a lot of big crazy events like this have sensory overload issues and there's no um, way for people to decompress because it's a loud environment. There's not usually like a quiet space or somewhere to go. And so we have a lot of problems with inaccessibility in that way. And you don't usually see, sometimes, but very rarely, you don't usually see any attempts by uh, coordinators and people to combat these issues and find a way to include these disabled people. Um, furthermore, uh, just even if you're just having a round table meetup, it might be upstairs in a coffee shop with no elevator or in a crowded bar that makes it hard for people who are hard of hearing. So one thing I would encourage you to do is just be conscious of how disabled people can access your events and things like that. And then um, the other thing I wanted to add about that was that we often want to fight the idea that our bodies have anything to do with our identities, which is true for the majority of people and is um, a valid viewpoint, but I also want to bring to the table the idea that for some disabled people, our body not working is part of our identity, and it does factor our body and appearance and choices do factor into our day-to-day -day lives. And so um, I was reading some articles for this and I found a really good quote, it's a little long, sorry, by a woman named Lucy Webster who contributed to BuzzFeed and wrote a couple articles. And she says, but we live in a society where more than anyone else, physically disabled people are defined by the visibility of our impairments. I'm willing to bet that every single person I meet notices my wheelchair before they notice my choice of outfit. Honestly, that's fine, but feminist discourse needs to acknowledge that my body does dictate some of my identity from how I socialize to the career decisions I make. Feminism would tell me that I should be able to do any job I want for which I am qualified, but the reality is I can never be a foreign correspondent or a roving reporter. I simply can't rove. Mainstream feminism needs to allow this to be okay and to not be something I feel obliged to fight all day, every day. So, um, as she put so eloquently, a lot of feminist discourse just needs to be a little more um, conscious of the way disabled women fit into that message. And um, I just want to add to that that disability isn't a shameful thing at all. I'm not upset to say that I'm disabled, but it does affect our perspectives and experiences and causes issues sometimes in day to day life. Okay, and then I just wanted to address the phrase strong independent women. <laughs> um, 
And when fighting stereotypes, we often sort of, um, you know, the ideal woman, we often counter it with ideals that your capability is equivocal to your worth, not your beauty and not your other things. And like I said before, these inherently do have merit, but it becomes problematic when you consider disabled women who certain capabilities and strengths and things like that might not be realistic. Um, strong, there are a lot of ways to be strong. And I don't necessarily see an issue with the word strong, but where my thing becomes problematic is with the independent portion of this. Um, independence, like I said, isn't realistic for many disabled women. And while I know this phrase is like somewhat exaggerated and used a little more jokingly nowadays, it's still pretty exclusive. And another thing that one of the survey goers, I t or survey goers, survey takers I listened to talked about was that it's almost a burden that places this stress on the shoulders of women to be something, and we've sort of replaced this one idea of an ideal woman with another one that's still not something that everyone can do. And, um, and from that, for that matter, I'm not even sure that independence is necessarily the best goal, because we're a society that lives and thrives with each other, and so I don't think there's shame in being dependent on things unless it's something that's forced on you by an intolerant society or um, a movement that has good goals but is unconscious of some problems. So, um, and then also there are some women who can be dependent but it's only through the use of assistive devices like wheelchairs, service dogs, oxygen tanks, etc. And being dependent on these things doesn't make them any less of a feminist than abled women. Um, personally, I'm relying on my service dog because uh, she allows me independence that my disability prevents on its own. But without her, I wouldn't be able to function, which is why I have this cute logo that my sister made. She made it on a t-shirt for me, and I think it's precious, so I just wanted to share that. Um, and another quote from Lucy Webster, the same person, was just that, I'm proud to be a disabled woman. I am also proud to be a feminist, but I wish the latter didn't force me often to ignore the specific challenges posed by the former. And so the question then that I wanted to pose and have you guys kind of brainstorm with me about was how do we make feminism more accessible um, and make disabled people feel more included and less ignored. And the most important thing I just want to put out there is for you to listen and be open-minded because disability is really often ignored as a minority um, and it's considered something that we just need to solve for ourselves since it's our individual problem and not something that the world needs to help make more accessible for everybody. Um, and so there's more overlap than initially appears and that ignorance is really pervasive still in the women's rights movements. Um, but before I give my own suggestions, I kind of wanted to open the floor and hopefully have a discussion with you guys and ask if you had any thoughts about how um, the women's rights movement can be more accessible or we can make events more accessible. Exactly, that physical presence can be a problem and disability advocacy is really popular online because of that same reason. So, anybody else? And so, something that I felt really pressured through the feminist movement is to give 110% all the time, you know, always standing up for yourself, always standing up for your gender, and I can't do that because of my disability. It physically exhausts me, um, and that's something that I've learned through the disability movement is knowing your limits. And I think that a lot of feminism puts a lot of pressure not just on disabled women, but on all women to really do everything all the time. And even people without disabilities, we need to know how to know our limits so that we protect ourselves and our bodies, but it's especially important for dis disabled women who get physically harmed by doing that. Mm -hmm. For sure. There's definitely a bit of oppression for 
pressure for women to never be weak, uh, to be good okay. feminists. So, did you have another thought too? Yeah. yeah. I think also just to think practically and think, okay, well, if there's a blind person and there's this event that they want to go to and you're going to, offer them a ride. Yeah, and exactly. Don't just assume that oh, they have their own personal chauffeur. Mm -hmm. And then also just a really like maybe calling ahead if it's an event at someone's house or something hey, I have a friend who has a service dog, and yeah. can they come? And then it just, it reassures the person that, okay, the whole me is welcome. Yeah. My, my, my dog can come too. Yeah, no, I love that. And I especially what you, love what you said about calling ahead for them too, because sometimes disabled people have trouble advocating for themselves for a variety of reasons. And so when you can help them with that step, assuming they're open to it and want your assistance, then when you can help them like that, that really takes the pressure off of you sometimes. Like there was one time when I was going over to a friend's house just for a party, like it wasn't even a big thing. And she called me beforehand a couple hours and left me a message and was like, I want you to know that Teddy is 100% welcome. And like, I don't want you to leave her at home. Please bring her. She's, and that takes so much pressure off of you when you know that um, you won't feel like your disability is impeding any of the social events going on. So the more you can tell people they're welcome, the better. <laughs> Does anybody else have any thoughts? before I give a couple suggestions myself. Okay, well I think it's just combat, yeah. like combating the language, right? Or the, mm -hmm. those, um, you know, I hear so often and just people in passing would see like, oh well, do they really even need the service dog? Mm -hmm. You know, or making those assumptions that people just want to take their dog to class exactly. with them. Um, in, or to restaurants or whatever. And I think being able to be an advocate I, I can say that for myself, I often, whenever I walk down the South Oval, I hear one of two things. <laughs> I hear, you're such a good Samaritan for training service dogs for other people, because she still has a training vest on. Like, wow, isn't it gonna be sad to give her away to a disabled person? <laughs> like, and you know, because nobody looks at me and thinks disability immediately. Or I get, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Which, what's wrong with you for asking me that question? <laughs> like, um, so I definitely agree that we need to sort of fight those. And the more you can advocate too, when you hear someone say that about somebody walking with their service dog and be like, they don't really need it, or they just want to take their dog to class, then that kind of thing helps too. So, yeah. Any more? I love this. This is great. This makes me so happy. Okay, so I will give you guys a couple then real quick. Um, this was something I touched on a bit earlier, but was finding new ways to meet up, like online advocacy is great too. Um, and or make a quiet space at your event. So like if you're at a march, find a maybe coffee shop nearby or a library or something and offer it for people to go and decompress for a few minutes if they become overwhelmed or they need a break or they can't do a particular part of your event for whatever reason. Then even just offering a space for them to relax a little bit and then come back and join the event will feel less exclusive. And then another thing is just physical accessibility like plain and simple is that um, I don't know if anybody else notices this but I've particularly noticed it since I got Teddy how many buildings on OU's campus just have that little sign that says inaccessible or inaccessible entrance and things like that is really common and so just making sure you are conscious of where you're doing your meetups and where you're doing your groups and making sure that everybody can get there even if you don't know that a disabled person's coming so say you don't know that someone's coming in a wheelchair, they still might want to just come and show up out of the blue. And they don't always know who to or how to talk ahead and be like, hey, can you make sure this is available for me? So if you can just have it there at the forefront, it helps a lot. And then also things like sign language interpreters as well for whenever you can provide them. And this is just to like um, not make you feel bad, even as someone Speaking about disability and feminism coming here, I didn't even think about getting a sign language interpreter until Thursday, at which point it was too late. And so um, it's not something that everybody's 100% at all the time. And you know, there are gonna be slip ups and things like that, but as much as you can try and be conscious and provide those things, it really helps. And then this is just another one, but just like your feminist blog and Twitter have image descriptions and things like that that make it accessible for blind people and things like that are just simple ways you can include more. And then, 
Oh yeah, this is just another quote from one of my survey people was, um, I'd like to see it more become more welcoming to disabled people and recognize that our brave and independent choices may look like they aren't simply because we often need significant supports. And so recognition of that strength and independence, even though it doesn't always look like it, is really critical. And then the last thing I wanted to say there too was that some people, particularly those with like developmental disabilities and learning disabilities, have trouble with quick comprehension and debate that sometimes goes on when you're talking with people. And so as much as you can sort of make sure everybody's getting a chance to contribute and think for a minute and have the ability to speak up is helpful because, you know, sometimes when you get into those arguments, people, it becomes real rapid fire about like uh, feminist and women's rights and issues like that. And so as much as you can make sure everybody's getting that is really helpful for your accessibility. Um, and that's pretty much all I have. It was a little shorter than some of the other presentations, but I did want to leave you guys with a quote from one of the survey people because I feel like it just really beautifully wrapped up everything I was thinking. And it's just that feminism has a solid foundation and is well established, so it's time to build upon that and to include as many perspectives in this effort as possible. If we do not, we will look back and see that we have built something beautiful that some still cannot access. And um, before I leave you, I just wanna say again, thank you so much for coming with open ears and open hearts because disability is ignored a lot and it can, it's, ableism is still really prevalent and pervasive in our society and even places that promote diversity and inclusivity still often forget about it. Like I said, usually it's not kicking out, it's forgetting about. And so I really appreciate your time and I really appreciate you guys listening to me and that's all I have for you today. So I hope you enjoyed. disempowering and 
like things like that. So just talking to them about it and being open and honest. Um, never go up to strangers and say, what's wrong with you? Or what's your disability? Um, sometimes the question of why you have a service dog is appropriate, but if you don't know someone very well, it's not very appropriate because um, you then have to disclose medical situations and like things about yourself that you might not want to. So um, I would just recommend trying to talk to people about it and helping them where you can, but always ask if they want the assistance first, because I know there are a lot of disabled people who get very frustrated when people automatically try and do everything for them rather than letting them have their independence and empowerment and do things for themselves if they can. Does that kind of help? Yeah. 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 So I was at an event and it was the first time I'd ever been um, in a situation where I saw the service dog actually work. Mm -hmm. And the person who the service dog was assisting had a seizure. Yeah. And so when you think about situations like that and you think about those of us who work at the university or even college mm -hmm. students, how do we find better ways of training to know how to respond in those situations? Yeah, I really, um, I think that, um, hold on, let me gather my thoughts for a second, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's always helpful, first of all, when students are like registered with the Disability Center because usually they can come to a professor particularly first um, and say, this might happen. If it does, here's what to do. But also a lot of the times, particularly with service dogs, they can be trained to get someone's help if it's needed, or they'll have information like in their vest pockets or on their vests about like call 911, don't call 911, things like that. Um, so if it's a service dog particularly, you can always um, go up and look and see if she doesn't, because I don't have seizures, so it's not uh, necessary, but um, they'll have patches that say like seizure alert dog, if, if having a seizure, don't call 911. But a lot of the times the service dogs are trained to do that. And then just, um, if a person's having a seizure and nobody is there assisting them and the dog's not doing them, then definitely go up. But if somebody's just um, seeming to have a distressed moment or something like that, I would go up and just ask, is there anything I can do to help you? And then if they need help, then they can get it from you. Or if they need to be alone or like by themselves, then they can ask you not to and they can ask you to leave. And just respecting that choice and like I said sort of um, autonomy and self um, self empowerment self capability whatever is the right word there um, is really helpful does that kind of answer yeah. the question okay yeah so I, I just want to interject um, yeah, please do about the first time seeing a dog work Lizzie being actually being disruptive right now and then jumping on my lap is actually working that is her testing because I get really flustered and anxious and actually having that stimulus can help calm me down. So a lot of times the dog, or like an allergy alert dog, they're always working, you know, they're always smelling. So even though it doesn't seem like they're working, they are a lot of the time. There are also sometimes very simple tasks, like Teddy does something called cover, where she just yeah. stands behind me, so there's not someone right behind me. Or like if I'm in the line at the grocery store, which like a lot of those things seem kind of like silly or like, why do you need that? But if somebody gets up right behind me, I can have panic attacks and it starts to really freak me out because of the nature of my disability and so sometimes like that kind of goes back to what you were saying about like well they don't look like they need a service dog before about people having that opinion and that's kind of in this kind of in the same spirit that you don't know what everything a service dog can be trained to do and so you might not be able to tell because you can't tell they're working so yeah. which so is the dog barked and yeah somebody knew what that had been okay in yeah the halls knew what to do to get help okay that's good right. yeah so it was one of those situations where I've never seen the dog like respond. Yeah, oh like, yeah, 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 for sure. And so no, I didn't need to call you out. Yeah, oh yeah. Because <laughs> it was like, no, that's the dog doing what it's supposed to yeah. do. But I feel like as, you know, if we work mm -hmm. in residential halls or if it happened in my class or something, yeah. like how to know what to do right. to respond. I really wish, and that's something I kind of, um, I tried to, with another person I know, get a while back for that freshman orientation training, you know, mm -hmm. they, where they do like alcohol awareness and things like that. Um, we really wanted to kind of get a presentation together for people about service dogs just so that they knew a little bit about what differentiates a, like an emotional support animal versus a service dog and then like you know a bit about how to respond or interact with service dogs like in situations like that so um, the truth of it is that we don't really have something um, I really wish OU would work more to create a uh, disability training for like professors, instructors, or administrative staff because 
because I think it would be really helpful, but it's not something we have right now. So um, the best I can recommend really is contacting like the DRC and asking them questions like that or um, looking online and uh, uh, sort of self-educating that way too. But unfortunately, it's not something that you really have right now. Yeah, I know at my previous institution, we actually even had a where you told students, okay, it's pretend, in a sense, pretend you were in a wheelchair and mm -hmm. you had to go onto different buildings. Yeah, on yeah. Campus. And then you recognize how unaccessible <laughs> yeah, the exactly. buildings are and how ridiculous they built them to be able to have. Exactly. And so until you do something like that, mm -hmm. you're completely ignorant. Exactly. How it might be for somebody who is mobile again. Yeah, and that's why I think it's like, that's why I was like really, again, excited to do this and like I think it's important to talk about it because I didn't even realize, like I said, seeing all those signs until I had Teddy. And I mean, she can go upstairs, so it's not an issue that way, but I just started to notice more about accessibility and things like that. And it's, it's something that's hard to comprehend or notice unless you become aware of it. Um, I believe, and to be honest, I'm not 100% sure about the answer, but I believe they arrange with the, and I think MG knows the answer to this question, but I believe they like arrange with the professor to move the class to a different building. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the student would contact the DRC, and the DRC would contact the professor, and they would move that class. Mm -hmm. um, there are, as I believe, there's like one building on campus that one floor isn't accessible, or, and actually I think it was the one that just got turned down, torn oh, down okay. and rebuilt, yeah. that, um, the old education building. I think all the buildings are accessible, um, but not well. For example, yeah. like Felger Hall, the only accessible entrance is the service entrance, which trucks park in. So mm -hmm. there isn't space for a wheelchair to actually get in there. But it is something where the student would contact the DRC and the DRC would, and would work with administration. Yeah, and that in itself is honestly a little problematic because then that requires students to register with the DRC if they're disabled, which can, um, honestly, it benefits a lot. I think it's wonderful and I think everybody should, who has a disability should register with us because we're great. But um, it can, some people aren't comfortable with that for a variety of reasons because they don't want to be, you know, it, it, uh, on a list somewhere that they're disabled or have it be recorded because they're uncomfortable and they know the discrimination that disabled people face or some people don't want to deal with it and they don't need other accommodations so they don't want to have to do that. So it would be much better if as a campus we were just accessible in the first place so then people could seek out accommodations if they wanted them rather than it being necessary sometimes. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of my perspective on that. And then I had another one. Yeah. Wait, you mentioned like service dogs versus emotional support. Yes. Dogs. Could you expand on that? Please thing? let me talk about that. <laughs> that's like all I talk about. Yeah. Um, so emotional support animals are animals that are not trained. They're just for comfort. So they help a lot with people with psychiatric disorders, so like depression or anxiety. They might just huddling your dog might give you a lot of sense of relief or um, particularly dogs like uh, if you have depression, you have to go out and walk them or they'll annoy the crap out of you, especially if you're in a tiny dorm room. So sometimes just keeping you active and things like that, but they're not actually trained to do anything. They're just their happy dog selves. Whereas service dogs go through a training process to have um, public access. So they're trained to behave well in public, not react to other dogs or other people or anything like that um, and react well to surprising situations so like if something drops on the floor and bangs they don't they might look at it but they're not supposed to like jump up or freak out and then they're also task trained which is what really makes them service dogs so um, they do something particular that um, let me think the ADA I believe particularly words it like they perform a task that limits the uh, limitations of your disability and allows you to function more easily in public or something like that. So um, they might retrieve things for somebody who has trouble bending over or can't do things like that. They might push buttons for someone in a wheelchair for the doors to open. Um, and to kind of highlight the difference between an emotional support animal and a service dog would be like a PTSD service dog. So even though that's similar to anxiety, which an emotional support animal might help with, PTSD service dogs are trained in a task, so there's something called deep pressure therapy they can do. So if you're having a panic attack or 
uh, are really distressed, they can put their pressure on you and it soothes your nerves and like calms your sympathetic nervous system. Or they can be trained, like I said, to do things like cover or um, what else? They can be trained to, if you have like unconscious behaviors like scratching, when you get stressed out, they can halt your scratching or like make you aware of it um, so that you stop. Or even, this is way more rare, but someone who has like, uh, really bad delusional states, they can keep you from like walking into traffic or something like that. So that's kind of the difference there is that emotional support animals are strictly for comfort and also very importantly, they don't have public access rights. So like they shouldn't be in classrooms or buildings like that because they don't have that training. Um, and they can distract uh, students or other service dogs is a big problem sometimes on this campus. <laughs> um, I have a friend who a dog that was definitely not a service dog uh, tried to lunge at her seizure alert dog and the dog didn't go alert to her seizure and so she had a seizure and she didn't know about it. Um, and so it seems kind of, um, it doesn't seem like the distinction is all that important but it really is. So that's kind of the best way I can highlight the differences between an ESA and a service dog. Are there people out there, um, emotional support animals, out with them still or no? They're not supposed to. And it does vary a little state by state. So, um, and Oklahoma recently like changed the laws of it or something. But um, uh, it does depend a bit state to state. But under the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the ADA, they don't have any public access rights, so they shouldn't be going out in public. But you see it a lot, especially at OU, with people taking their ESAs to class or to buildings and things like that. Um, so it depends a bit state to state, but generally. States can provide that um, protection for ESAs, but they a lot of them don't. So. But on this campus, pe people kind of do yeah, it. people do it. They're not really supposed to, but people do it. Do they have vests? Right? Yeah, a lot of them have like a vests that will say ESA. And the other thing is that um, some dog owners or some ESA owners don't know all of the differences, and so I think education on that is really important. So they'll put like a service dog vest on their dog. Mm -hmm. but well, fortunately and unfortunately. So oh. now that we're getting into service dogs, I'll give a bit on that. Um, it's sort of a pro and a con that you can kind of buy a service vest online because mm -hmm. a lot of people see the problems with it, with people can just take their pet dog anywhere they go and say it's a service dog because it has a vest or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a really big problem, uh, especially lately. It's kind of been in the news and kind of has given service dogs a bad rap. Um, but the other thing too is that um, if you require official registration or like that you have to get your vest from this place and sign up somewhere then it can prevent some disabled people from having access to service dogs because like it's i don't know if you guys are aware of this but a fully trained service dog costs like upward of fifteen thousand dollars if it's like a guide dog or something really specifically trained like that it can be like upwards of thirty thousand or forty thousand so it financially really limits people because right now you can legally train your own dog, which is what I'm doing with some assistance from a trainer, so I'm doing kind of a mixed thing. But um, so having people be able to just buy service dog vests online also gives disabled people who don't have a lot of access to resources and help the ability to take their service dog places and work on training. So kind of a complicated issue that doesn't have a perfect answer, but. There are like training companies private specifically. Industry. Yeah, I believe so. I believe it's fully private industry. Yeah, a lot of them are nonprofits, and yeah. a lot of them have um, either like scholarships that you can get, so you don't have to pay them. A lot of them do, where you have to, they don't actually charge for the dog, but you have to do fundraising. Yeah. So you actually have to like fundraise five thousand dollars, but then it's not like a flat out charge, or you just pay or a yeah, or like payment pan, program, like a sliding things, scale. But um, but yeah. So that's kind of where it stands. A lot of a lot of them, like you said, are nonprofits, and then there are others that just train their dogs to sell. Yeah. Okay. And I just wondered about the ESAs. I've heard of people having like emotional support chinchillas <laughs> or like emotional support guinea pigs, yeah. hamsters. Do you feel? Do you think? Do, does the ESA person get to choose which kind of animal they have and like suit it to their needs? Yeah. Or? I think I'm trying to think of the. I know under the ADA only dogs and in some situations miniature horses for mobility issues are accepted as service dogs. 
I don't know if there's exact wording about what an emotional support animal is. So theoretically, anything could be an emotional support animal. I don't personally understand how a snake is comforting to you, but <laughs> that might be my life fear of snakes. So, um, so it's kind of complicated. Um, ESAs with like chinchillas and snakes or whatever like that, um, I don't have a much as much of an issue with as long as people respect the not having public access rights with that because that is dangerous and unsanitary for a lot of reasons. But um, I think any animal can be an ESA legally. Psychologically, I don't know what the study is on how much comfort that adds, but legally. So what would be the difference between a regular pet and an ESA if ESAs don't have public access or any special rights? Yeah, so an ESA is just something that's like, um, they've been, basically you get a note from a psychiatrist or therapist or some sort of doctor saying that it medically it really improves your condition or something okay. like that. So someone who... So most people, honestly, who have like depression and anxiety uh, could probably benefit from an ESA because I think animals are really helpful and really uh, intuitive in understanding you. So, um, but somebody who uh, just has their pet for fun, the pet doesn't really comfort them and things like that, um, isn't an emotional support animal. And they're not technically an emotional support animal unless you have that letter from a doctor clarifying them and such. Even if and then they don't get to do anything different. Yeah. They? Oh, except for they get to go into housing yeah. without any pet fees, and they get to go on planes in carriers in like the plane car, not underneath the plane. So, but yeah. even like what's in apartment complex doesn't allow pets. Then like you have to allow ESAs, not pets. Yeah. Okay, so it has to be an ESA yeah. or a service dog. Yeah, yeah. So yes, letter you say well, it's an ESA. Yeah, yeah exactly. So and in that case, them. they can't limit them or give you a pet fee. Oh, okay. Uh, just to let you guys know, everybody's finished. So. Okay, I'm so glad. Thank you guys. Yeah, so we'll have a session. Oh, yeah.